So, a lot of you will know that Courtney Summers is one of my favourite authors. Author of Sadie. The, I didn't grab these in a good way. <laughs> Sadie, The Project, I'm the Girl, Cracked Up To Be. Listen, I love Courtney Summers. <laughs> and recently, we got talking on Instagram through a series of events, and I said, would you ever want to do a video where you pick what I read? And Courtney said yes, so that's what we're doing today. <laughs> One of my favourite authors, let's be honest, I talk about Courtney Summers all the time, one of my favourite authors is going to pick what I read. How exciting. So we're going to find out some of Courtney's favourite books that she wants me to read. I cannot believe this is reality. I am so excited. I hope you guys are too. And yeah, we'll also have an interview with Courtney throughout this. And very excitingly, we're going to be doing a giveaway. So check the link down below. So yeah, shall we just get into the video? <laughs> believe this is reality. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> um, it's time to find out. <laughs> it's time to find out what books Courtney has recommended to me. It has chosen for me to read. I feel sick. I actually feel mm, horrific. Like <laughs> Get that fire rick sick door. I'm off. Mom. I have no idea. What books? Like, I don't even know what kind of books Courtney reads. I don't know what we're in for here. I am so, I am so nervous. So nervous. So nervous. But I don't have anything else to say to you. I just need to find out what these books are. We're not talking anymore. We're getting... <laughs> we're getting this, uh, this video up and we're going to watch it. Oh my gosh. I can't even tell you predictions because it's not like a booktuber who I watch and watch review books. Like, I have no idea. Anyways, let's find out. I feel sick. I'm gonna try and not scream too much so that you can actually hear what Courtney is saying. I'm gonna try and just, you know, facial expression <laughs> react because usually I talk over these things too much. Okay. Hi Meg, thank you so much for inviting me on your channel to put my taste in books on trial. I'm very excited to be here today to recommend three books that I really enjoyed and that I hope you like, if not love. And if not love, I am going to unsub and report this video to YouTube. It's no big deal. <laughs> Hello to your subscribers. Um, I count myself among them. You have shaped my TBR on more than one occasion. And something I really enjoy about your approach to reading is that you're willing to meet a book where it is. And by that I mean you'll often decide whether or not it's achieved what it set out to do on its own terms. And you'll also weigh that against whether it was successful in achieving that on your terms as a reader. And I find that makes for a really balanced and thoughtful and nuanced recommendation. And that's what I'm looking for as a reader. So thank you for okay. that. As an author, it's been very cool to see my books pop up on your channel from time to time. Um, I discovered it through your review of the project. Um, a friend of mine saw it and sent it to me. They're like, you're going to get such a kick out of this. And you know, <laughs> your reaction was just, it was so much fun to watch. But more than that, you really dug into the text and oh the writing God. in a way that was really gratifying. And you did the same most recently for I'm the Girl, which I really appreciated. You gave it a very thoughtful and sensitive read, and it's very specifically for the readers that it is for. And those are survivors and victims of sexual violence who want to be seen and heard and believed in the books that they read. And I think the way that you approach Georgia's story will give those readers the opportunity to find it for themselves. It's very gratifying when I get that kind of read and that kind of consideration. So thank you so much for that too. You're very consistently thoughtful in the way that you approach books and you just do a really great job. So good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, pause for a second. <laughs> Lux, I can't. Um, so wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I don't think I did a very good job of reacting. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> a, I'm trying not to say anything so that you can actually hear what Courtney is saying. But, um, that was, wow. <laughs> Let me, I can't be vulnerable. No, that was one of the kindest stuff that's ever been said to me. Wow. That's like, Courtney, listen. <laughs> I feel like as a booktuber, I have never had someone speak to me about my videos like that before. Whoa. <laughs> and for it to be one of my favorite authors, I don't even know how to react. <laughs> I'm 
that's very kind. Courtney's the best, you know, author I've ever had interactions with, kindest, so lovely, and I'm just so excited to be doing this video together. So, um, wow, okay. <laughs> I don't know how to react to that. Let's find out what the books are, okay. So when it came time to pick books for you, I, I had sort of like two requirements. I wanted to pick books that sort of sat opposite of the emotional damage that mine tend okay. to cause and might help <laughs> heal some of it. Appreciate it. <laughs> and also to give you stories that really gave you something to dig okay. into. Ooh. So, I guess without further ado, <laughs> let's get sick. to it. Let me show you these books. So this is one of my most cherished books, No Pressure. Oh. I end my reading year by starting it, and I start my new reading year by finishing it. I love its optimism about our present because so much of it is looking back on our current moment from the future, and I love how it shows how far reaching the unexpected impact of a single life can be. And I think there's a lot about the language and the structure and the interwoven narratives that you'll appreciate, and that's why my first pick for you is Station Eleven by Emily St. Okay. John and I'm excited for that. You didn't help but notice okay. the absence of this author on oh. your Goodreads, who I think is brilliant through okay. and through, and I think it's time you got acquainted. He has this wonderful knack of taking these strange concepts and writing them in such a way they feel entirely real. His writing's tonality is just wonderful. You said something really cool about the project, something really nice about the project, about these sort of unexpected ways I'd string a sentence together. And that's what I hope you like about this author. On a sentence level, he's just putting words together in the most wonderful and surprising way. And that author is Kevin Wilson. The book is Nothing to See Here, which is probably the sweetest and funniest and most big-hearted story about emotionally damaged children who spontaneously combust into flames <laughs> and the emotionally damaged young woman who has to name them. Okay. I read over 100 oh books God. in 2022, okay. which is pretty epic for me. And when I challenged myself to pick just one to recommend to everyone, um, I immediately thought of this one. And this is one of the most wildly inventive and unique reading experiences that I've ever Exciting. had. It's surprisingly heartfelt, but it's very, very funny. And your own sense of humor and your sense of timing with the funny little <laughs> video inserts you put in your vlogs makes me think you might appreciate the humor that's on display in this book, which is Several People Are Typing by Calvin Casalt. I haven't heard of that. This is a story told entirely through a workplace's Slack chat, and one of the principal characters' consciousness gets sucked into the Slack, and the Slack bot takes over his body on the outside. What? It is it's something really extraordinarily <gasps> special. And 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 just again wholly unique. I hope you love it. Oh my god. There's your Rex. I hope you know, like let's get reading. Good luck. I don't know if that's <laughs> the book is for me or for you, but maybe we both need it. So good luck to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you so much, Courtney, again for that video. I can't I'm gonna be watching that every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't this. Okay. I, I was shocked. I was shocked. Station Eleven, I own. I'm very excited. I've read one Emily St. John Mandel and I've always wanted to read Station Eleven. I feel like it's one of the big books I've missed out on at a period when I wasn't really reading. So I'm very excited to see that there. And the other two I know nothing about. Like I I think I've seen nothing to see here about a bit. I maybe I think I've seen that a few times recently, but the other one. So these are like I'm going in blind. <laughs> to expect. I guess we will start with Station Eleven because that is the one that I already own and we're gonna have uh, an interview with Courtney interspersed throughout this video as well so let's hear a bit from Courtney, let's hear more from Courtney <laughs> and uh, get reading on Station Eleven. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> so I thought it'd be fun to chat about first because obviously you've given me book recommendations for this video. Yes. I was wondering if you could just like sum up your reading taste. What kind of genres, tropes, styles do you think you're drawn to most? Oh my god. Well, see, I used to think that I was like one type of reader where I was like, it's got to be miserable. It's got to make me super <laughs> unhappy. Well, I, I was like, yeah, like I'm a like I'm a thriller, grisly, ugly stories kind of person. Mm. And then I got an e-reader in 2020. And when you don't have to put books on, like I look at your bookshelves and I'm like, oh my god, that's so much upkeep. Yeah, and I you know. know how you do it. <laughs> and, and then I saw you do the unhaul and I was like, oh my God, this is giving me anxiety. <laughs> so as soon as I got an e-reader, I was like, 
these aren't physical. I can get whatever I want. Like, cause you'd start, do you do that? Like you really weigh what you put on your shelves? Yeah. And it's like, okay, this is taking up space. So it better like be my whole personality. That's the type <laughs> yeah. of Yeah. So I find it actually, my reading taste since I got an e-reader has really expanded. And I like these like heartwarming books about the human experience that make you feel good. Like, I think I recommended quite a few of them to you. Like, like yeah. all three of them are somewhat affirming. So I was like, oh, so that's who I am. Still like yeah. dark stuff though. Yeah. Miserable stuff too, yeah. it's always welcome. But yeah. <laughs> Listen, a mix of both. You gotta have, gotta have both. <laughs> well balanced. I believe in balance. And what would you say are the biggest influences on your writing? That's a big question, I know, but oh, gosh. I'd be intrigued um, to know. <laughs> I loved, like, um, have you ever read Robert Cormier? No. Well, he wrote The Chocolate War. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that book was, I actually read that in my, like, early, very, very early 20s. I would not even say that I was still a teenager because 20 is, like, so young. It's, like, right yeah. 19, 20, still a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, there, in that book, it's, like, about a chocolate bar sale, which is, like, okay. I know, in a Catholic school, and it's an all-boys school, and someone refuses to sell chocolates, and it ends, it, like, ruins his entire life. And in the end of, and in the end of the book, it's, like, None of this was worth anything. This was the worst experience of my life. I learned nothing. People are inherently terrible. And I was like, <laughs> yes, you know, like that's that that was the it, he was such a such a huge influence because he's like, I don't have to give you a happy ending. I don't have to make you feel good at the end of this book. And I was like, mm. that's what I want to do. I want to hurt people. <laughs> so he was the biggest. Oh, gosh. And how would you say like day to day your reading impacts your writing? I'd be intrigued to know. I think, oh my God, there was like a discourse recently on, on the internet. Mm -hmm. Where else? <laughs> the internet. <laughs> Nobody talked about the internet. <laughs> um, where it's like, I think someone said, if you want to be a good writer, you have to read. And then everyone's like, well, that's not true for everyone. But I, I found that it's like, it's certainly true for me. I think mm -hmm. my writing is always, you know, you pick up a book and you're challenged by what you read or you want to you want to prove you can either do it better or you're like, I can't do it better than that. So I should try to be as good as I can. Like, I can't imagine uh, a scenario where reading doesn't fit into my writing life. It's, it's there to push me. It's there to make me think bigger. It's like you're having a conversation with yourself when you read and that's how you, you grow. Like yeah. Katie yeah. yeah. Smith had a really good quote about reading. She was like, um, you know, it's, I wish I had it on hand because it was so good you've got to find it but it's about how like reading teaches you to be human mm. i agree with that like it's a whole thing you develop your empathy through the experiences of others and you can find them in a book you can safely explore terrible things Look, like, i mean not like I, you know not i don't mean like you i've always wondered what it would be like to be a murderer so i'm gonna read not like that but you know what i mean like no, it's a yeah. safe space to like find you know to learn about people mm. and you know, hopefully, hopefully you're not reading the terrible books that teach you to go out to be a murderer. I don't know anything about those books. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, something I'm always really interested in is do you find that when you're working on a book, um, do you read books and consume media that's like a similar vibe or topic to that book? Or do you kind of stay away from books that are similar for fear that it will kind of like that book will bleed too much into your current project. I don't know. I just read what I want to read. You know. Oh if it's, yeah. If it's similar, like. Yeah. Idea. There's so many books where, like, if you just read the summary, it'd be like, oh no, you know, they're all the same. <laughs> but yeah. then you get like, like, but the voice part—that's the part that can't be replicated. That's the the thing that's going to be different every time. So I'm not as concerned about that. I remember when I like wrote all the rage and and it took like it took something like six drafts or maybe four or five or four or five or six drafts that's three different numbers but it was one of them <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the same time that i wrote it someone else came out with an idea that like superficially it sold in publishers marketplace it was like the same concept superficially two entirely different books mm. some point in worrying about something like that everyone's always writing the same thing but it's different yeah. In the end. yeah yeah because i hear some authors talk about like when they're writing like i don't know i'm trying to give an example like a witchy book they'll only read other witch books and i'm like i feel like that would for me i don't know if that would work because i'd be worried that other people's ideas would bleed into mine too much but i wouldn't necessarily feel the same way with consuming like other media that was like yeah. films well, or I mean, whatever that's that was true. you similar. don't want to be like it's good to know what you're writing if you're entering like the marketplace you want to know what's similar or what everyone's doing 
by the time I'm writing a book, I've already uh, probably read and been interested in the things that have brought me to that point. So it's like after that, except for the project, then I just read cult things like 24-7. But that was just sort of keep me grounded in the topic. Because with, with cult books, it's like, it's so easy to forget the people involved and just like the whole spectacle of it. So I just wanted to, I kept reading books about Jones. Cause that's probably the only time that I've done something like that. Yeah, because I felt like that when reading the project, because I think sometimes with cult books, like you said, it's like the spectacle and like, oh, right. look, rather than actually like thinking of the people who have been in, in those situations themselves yeah. when writing it. But I'd love to know also how like that initial spark of inspiration for your books come. And do you have any examples of like when we had a moment that where a book, the spark that the book grew from came, I guess. God, I guess like with Sadie, I was like, uh, why can't a book be a podcast? And, like, <laughs> and then it sort of went from there. And, and Serial had just come out and everyone was responding to this show with such fervor. And I was like, my God, that's got to have some kind of emotional consequence to everyone involved, no matter what side of the conversation that they're on that, that mm. has to take an emotion. I was like, that sounds traumatic. And I like to write about traumatic things. Everything starts with the seed of trauma. I really, <laughs> yeah. You know, like the, um, I'm the girl is the Epstein case, devastating. Mm. And then actually it's anger. It's always anger. It's not trauma. I'm just always angry about something. Mm. And, and now it's the entire back catalog of my book. It's just an exercise <laughs> in being angry. But it's a good way to, when you're angry about something to, I guess, sometimes I feel like in, especially with social media, we're, we're constantly given all this like awful information of awful things yes. that are happening world and you feel kind of like hopeless like what can I do about that but by writing a book from that anger you, f you you're able to kind of like work through those feelings and give someone who may be experiencing something similar like a way to work through or it we're all well. just getting angrier in a different way <laughs> that's true as yeah. well, no. I mean, I, it's you know it's social media my god you know through the the Trump years like that was mm. just a complete inundation of one terrible thing after the other. Mm. And it's it's like, it was very bleak for, it still is bleak in many ways. And I mm. think, uh, I don't know, you can give in to hopelessness or you can try to channel it into something. I think there's really something powerful in healing less alone. I mean, mm. I don't know if it always crystallizes into action. Obviously reading a book is, is you're connecting in a very personal way to something. It's what you do next that's gonna matter more than sitting there flipping the pages. Mm. But it's it's nice to know that something could potentially inspire someone to use their anger in a productive way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I am like 100 pages, 109, 110, 110 pages into stage 11. And I have thoughts, I have thoughts. <laughs> Okay, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. The story of Station Eleven is kind of dual timeline, I guess. I don't even know if I say dual. It's like hopping around in time. And the kind of central event is that there is a pandemic that wipes out about 99% of the Earth's population. The first, like, I think 30-ish pages of the book is, like, the beginning of the pandemic, like, kind of the night or the days in which it first all unfolds. And then we're kind of in 20 years into the pandemic following some characters, and then we've just jumped back in time and followed some other characters <laughs> for a period of time. And... I am surprised by how similar this is to the other Emily St. John Mandel I've read, which was The Glass Hotel. Because when I read The Glass Hotel, I thought, oh, Station Eleven must be really different to this because I can't picture this book being as mainstreamy, five stars, everyone loves it as Station Eleven is. But they're so similar. And I'm the part of what I'm having the most fun about reading this is seeing the similarities between them. The way that Emily St. John Mandel weaves all these narratives and these storylines, and we're only at the beginning, but these people together is so interesting. And there's something about her writing, oh, this is so difficult to describe, but it's very unique. It feels so intimate with the characters because we get this information that is simultaneously like needed and like required and oh my head <laughs> and like we're needed for the story but it's it's the kind of information like in a book that another author would not include do you know what i mean 
I'm nodding like I understand, but I'm not so sure I do. Like we just had a section particularly following Miranda, who's a character in the past, and just the stuff that we were learning about her and the feelings that were mentioned of her and like, I don't know, just all the information we were getting. It felt so intimate because it felt like we were bearing witness to parts of her that if like another author had written this, we wouldn't. Does that make any kind of sense? <laughs> I really don't know. But I'm loving that aspect of it. And there's a lot about Shakespeare in the in the future, in the pandemic, we're following a traveling company who performs Shakespeare to kind of the small communities that have kind of sprung up. I guess it does kind of feel like the characters are on a stage. There's that kind of distance, but I don't know, there's something so intimate about it as well. So I'm really enjoying that reading experience of it. And there's something about, I feel like a running theme in her books is like the cyclical nature of people or items. Like already we're having people or items, like objects reoccurring throughout the book and popping up here and popping up there. And it's just, it's a very interesting way of storytelling and I'm interested to see what the effect of that is going to be throughout the book as the book goes on and kind of what that means. And yeah, I'm interested to see where the story's gonna go. It feels like not much has happened because we've kind of been jumping about in storylines and parts of the book. Uh, so I'm interested to read a bigger chunk next and get kind of into the meat of the story and see where it goes. Cause I don't really have any thoughts on what it's trying to say yet or what it's trying to do. I'm just finding certain like technical things that she's doing interesting. So I wanna try and read most of this today. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm hoping to get through most of it. So I will read, how long is this book? When I've read like a hundred pages, I like to then split what I've got left to read into like two and then check in with you halfway. The book is 333 pages long and I'm up to page 110. So I'll check in something around 220. <laughs> This is different than what I expected because I didn't know we'd be jumping around in narrative and time so much. I thought it was just pandemic, 20 years on, we're there. But very interesting, very unexpected. I'm excited to see where it's gonna go next. It's much later, can we tell? I have got up to that point in station 11. Uh, so I've got about 100 pages to the end. Okay, <laughs> I don't have many more thoughts than when I last checked in with you. Something that I've been enjoying in the last few pages. This is a book that makes you think, right? It's making me think. <laughs> you sound rather stupid to me, you know. You know, you're sort of person. If you had a brain, you'd be dangerous here. I feel like a running theme, of course, is the overt theme of art with the company, the traveling company, performing Shakespeare and plays for people in this world that where the world has basically ended and this, there's still being that desire for performance. But I feel like not only that, there's a running theme, there's um, these comic books uh, that one of the characters got near the end of the world and the the attachment that she has to them um, is very interesting and we follow the author of those comic books throughout uh, as well and I it just got me thinking about like the not necessarily just the importance of art but like once you put art out into the world whatever form it's in or a creative work I don't want to say <laughs> you know <laughs> but once you put any creative art work out into the world how it's like it's no longer yours, you know, this is, I mean, uh, my videos, I'm not saying the art, but it's a creative piece, right? <laughs> kind of, I guess. I don't know, it's a form of entertainment, essentially. Any form of entertainment, my videos, like once I put them out into the world, how they're received is separate from me, the creator, and I never get to know necessarily how they're received unless, you know, I read your comments. And I just think that's interesting, like, seeing art from the reaction to art <laughs> truly from that other person's perspective and like no longer talking about my videos but like how a book right can have 
once an author puts that out into the world, kind of the reaction and what happens is like not dependent on them. It's the person's experience with that art and how like a book or like in this case, a comic book or whatever can hold such gravitas and like be almost a form of identity for a person without the creator of that knowing. And uh, their whole experience with the piece being their creation of it. I don't know how I'm explaining this, but I just think it's an interesting... Uh, element that the book is examining and the need for all this in a world that you know we don't have cars we don't have planes we don't have you know everything we know about life has gone so I think that's interesting I don't know I'm liking that's making me think however there has been a few moments where I've been a bit bored you better f***ing take that back right now you better stop it stop, 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 stop right stop. now I feel like that's sacrilegious <laughs> I'm just thinking of Courtney being like this is my favorite book ever <laughs> Shit. but I think you know, the more I think about it, this is a book that demands a lot of you, it demands your attention, it demands your focus, because it's not like, you know, a thriller, where it's like, oh, here is what happened. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's meaning, and there's layers, and there's a lot unsaid behind everything. And I have just basically been reading this book all day, and I've been reading it slowly. I haven't wanted to rush through this. I've read basically 200 pages today, and that's all I've done. <laughs> I haven't done anything else. I'm gonna, it's like half eight, now, uh, I'm going to take my makeup off, do some yoga, move a bit, <laughs> and then try and read a bit more tonight. But yeah, I feel like there's been moments where I haven't been giving it the kind of like thought processness that it deserves, but I am enjoying it. I don't think it's going to be a five star, but I really enjoy reading Emily St. John Mandel's books. There's something very unique. I don't think I've read anything I don't think I've read an author with the same kind of writing style like her, so I'm enjoying it, but yeah. Okay, I'm gonna say something, and no one's allowed to be mad at me. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a 3.5. That's not bad, okay? A 3.5 isn't bad, it's a 3.5. It's a 3.5 for me, okay? <laughs> I feel like the whole vlog I've been pretty positive about this, because from a, like, a theoretical, analytical technical standpoint I can really appreciate what this does but in terms of my enjoyment I got to the end and I was like okay <laughs> I was talking to my mum about this because she really doesn't like unresolved endings right and this ending is kind of just like it just ends you know what I mean and usually in books I don't mind that I like unresolved open endings but this I just kind of ended it and I was like oh it's the trough like, I didn't, I wasn't like, whoa, yeah, I just read a good book. I read a great book. Like, from a theoretical, what this is doing, what this is saying, oh, yeah, I love it. But, oh, my God, Courtney, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it feels so bad. This feels, this feels terrible. I feel horrific. <laughs> I also think your reading experience of this is going to be very different whether you read it for the first time before the pandemic or after. Not saying like either of those is worse or better than the other. I just think living through what we've lived through affects how you would have read this versus if you had read it when it first came out, right? And I think maybe I would have had a different reaction to it if I'd read it when it first came out. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I'm not saying you're gonna like it less if you read it for the first time now, or you're gonna like it more. I'm just saying it's gonna be a different reaction. And I just, I was kind of bored sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> this was a strange book for me because I could read it and be like, oh, I love what this is doing and I love what this is doing. And it was weird because when I was reading it, I was kind of bored, but then whenever I put it down, I wanted to pick it straight back up again. I don't know, I've rounded up to a four. It's maybe more like a 3.75 if I'm being honest, but I don't really do <laughs> quarter decimal points for ratings, so I'm just giving it a 3.5. It was good. I can understand why people love it, but I just didn't get that feeling that I feel like when I read the reviews, so many people have had like, oh my god, this is incredible, my favorite book ever. Like, I don't know. I think I preferred The Glass Hotel. Uh, so I don't know. But anyways, I am gonna start next. Several people are typing and I'm gonna try and read this this morning. It's like 10 o'clock, half 10. And I'm just gonna try and read the whole thing. It's uh, just told through a, a Workplaces Slack channel. And so it's all just like chat. And I think it will be like, I think I'll read this in like an hour or two, essentially. So I'm just gonna go ahead and sit down and start making my way through this. And I'll check in with you when I'm halfway. But first, Let's hear a bit more of my interview with Courtney. <laughs> and something, I really wanted to ask you about this because it's a thought I had whilst reading <laughs> Station Eleven. 
one of the books you chose. Um, <laughs> I love that book. I think I said in my video, I watched that one, or no, I watch it. I read it once a year. It's like the, one of the most important books in my life and I put it in your hands. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, my question is, not saying anything. <laughs> Something I really took from that is like when a person is creating art, be that a book or a film or whatever, the relationship that they they have a relationship with that art and then it goes out into the world and the audience has a relationship with that art and they're so completely separate from each other. Um, and I just wondered what your experience with that has kind of been. It's been it's been interesting. I really I think you're when you were reading I'm the girl it was a really good example of like I didn't enjoy this at all but I see the merit in it you know but like that's important to me because I can't write a book that's going to please everyone so I'm like mm. can I at least write a book that you know I've tried to bring a lot of integrity into its process mm -hmm. that's meaningful if it can't be meaningful to everyone I want it to be meaningful to the people that it's for but like once it's out there it's like Whew. And then after a book like well after a book like Sadie, the one thing that I'm getting used to hearing is that every book that has followed is not Sadie. It's like oh, oh. I know that. <laughs> I know that. It's a different it's, book, of course. Yeah, it's, not. it's a different book, but it was it was the book that really uh, it broke me out. It's very strange mm. to have a mid career breakout because people uh, are coming in there and they don't know what you've done before, and and then everything after is measured against this thing you've been doing in the middle. So you're like, I've been doing what I've always been doing. But everyone's coming at your work from a, a different place, and so so absorbing all those reactions, it's very, it's wild. It's not a bad thing. It's just, it's like, wow. Yeah, you know, intense. It's, it, yeah, it is. It can be yeah. intense. But, yeah. Yeah. But I've never wanted to make people happy, so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember, so Sadie was the first book I read from you and it was one of the first audiobooks I ever listened to and I remember I, I, I listened to a few before and I'd always listened to them whilst doing stuff but I remember for the end of Sadie I just sat down on my bed and I just listened to the ending like this and I was like what? <laughs> I went into my mum's room I was like mum you can't believe I just read! <laughs> Good. I was like walking up and down the hall, like, oh my god! <laughs> I love this visual. It makes me happy. It pleases my heart. A lot of people were like, that's not the ending I want. <laughs> I, someone got, can we do spoilers? Yeah. Yeah, it's been like five years. Someone, I've, I've never been upset about that ending. I was like, that's gotta be the ending. Mm -hmm. Then so, someone on Twitter, like, oh, I just, it haunted me forever. She goes, I hope that Sadie died. I don't know, I wonder if Sadie died thinking she'd failed. And I was like, oh, that's hard. Uh. <laughs> so she didn't know she killed the guy. I was like, oops. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs>Halfway through, several people are typing. It took me about 35 minutes, I wanna say. Could have been half an hour if I didn't get a little bit distracted by my phone <laughs> to read half. So it's definitely a very quick read. And basically, uh, one of our characters is working on a spreadsheet and he accidentally uploads his consciousness to the Slack channel. <laughs> He's like stuck. His like body is still out there, but he is stuck in the Slack channel basically his consciousness all of his ideas or whatever and everyone thinks it's like a bit everyone's like okay, okay funny, funny. <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically what it is and i am enjoying it so it's all just told through like text messages but in mixed media you know or slack messages i should say do we use slack in the uk i don't know anyone who uses it but i assume we do people i know who work in kind of like teams based <laughs> jobs all use microsoft teams in the uk it's like a thing anyway i understand what it is in theory so yeah it's all these messages from each other and i think there's a lot that's interesting to be said about work culture about like work life balance that i think is really interesting but there's also been a lot of chat about like the internet as a whole and it's got me thinking like <laughs> it's talking a lot about how we're all constantly performing and like putting, there's constant ideas out there and constantly putting ourselves out there and we're all performers and audience at the same time. And it's something I think about a lot because I don't really tweet anymore. I don't really upload to Instagram that because I feel like I get all of my, like I feel like we are instinctively, especially if you're around my age, like we've been bred almost to want to be these performers, to want to share, to want to be on stage, to want to, be seen online. Oh, I'm a star! 
And I feel like I get all of that out in my videos. <laughs> like I don't feel the need to tweet or Instagram anymore because I've got this. I don't know, I think I've gotten good at switching off from social media, but sometimes that's not good for like my videos and <laughs> social media. Like if I go out for dinner, I don't want to take a picture of what I'm eating. I don't want to like think about everything I do being perceived by the internet, but then sometimes I have to. <laughs> So I don't know, it's just an interesting balance. And I think now that this is like my job, I think a lot about the personal divide between online and in person. And I just think it's interesting and I'm enjoying the conversations that are being brought up about it here. I love deleting my Twitter and Instagram. Like I love deleting, <laughs> not like off the face of the earth, but off my phone. But I can only ever do it for a short period of time. So I'm like, right, I have to get it back now so I can see what's happening, so I can see what's going on. If I'm not posting, like being tuned into the consciousness is interesting. And there's also been stuff about the algorithm in this, like how you are constantly getting the opinions of people who are exactly like you, think exactly like you, and it's all perfectly attuned. Like I've been seeing so much with YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, I don't have TikTok because I don't want to get in, down the rabbit hole. But like how, when you, when you st stay on one kind of video for a certain amount of time, everything becomes that. So like it's suddenly all reading reels or all that girl girl reels or all weightlifting reels like everything becomes that you are suddenly this person because you've shown a certain amount of interest in something i don't know it's really interesting i'm enjoying it it's not feeling like a five star but i feel like it could be it's a very i don't know interesting way of telling a story that i'm enjoying but i also i'm about to go make lunch but i also did just get a parcel and i think i know what it is and i'm very 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 excited wow this is big holy shit that's what she said. So this is a proof of Reach for the Stars by Michael Craig, which is a non-fiction book following 1996-2006 like British pop. I can't believe, I didn't realize this would be this big. It's 500 pages. To be fair, the font is really big. But I love, you know, naughty's pop like looking into the culture, like Sugar Babes, like S Club 7, do you know what I mean? I'm so interested to find out about this. It seems like a lot of interviews. Oh my God, busted or interviewed, get the fuck out. Thank you so much to 98books for sending this to me. I cannot wait to read it, I'm very excited. This is like my kind of thing. Oh, I'm excited. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go make some lunch and I'll check back in with you once. I've read the other half of this. Uh, another book finished <laughs> and it's another 3.5 <laughs> cut the cameras dead ass there, there's the thing 3.5 is a good rating you know it exceeded expectations a three is met expectations if you think about it logically <laughs> I enjoyed this. It just wasn't, when I think of what I've been giving a four star lately in terms of my enjoyment, it didn't quite reach that. I think part of the problem is like, I've never worked in an office and had this kind of like work chat. I just don't know what it's like. <laughs> so I think perhaps some of the humor was lost on me, but I love the blend of like sci-fi horror that this is. I had a great time, listen, it took me I don't know, an hour and a half max to read. So it was a very quick read. It is one of the weirdest <laughs> things I've probably read in a while. I haven't been reading enough weird stuff lately. And Courtney said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rectify that. Yeah, it's one of the weirdest, strangest books I've read in a long time. There was a few plot twists I didn't expect. I'm not gonna lie. Um, where it was kind of blurring the lines between reality and I still don't know the answers to a lot of what happened. I had a good time reading this, but I don't know how far in the future I'm gonna remember it or think about it. You know what I mean? I'm glad I've read it. Like it's so absurd and ridiculous. Like, <laughs> so imaginative and different to anything else I've read, but it just didn't feel like a four. So I'm so sorry. My gosh. <laughs> I 
don't know what to say. There's another thing I often find with like horror, because this is horror, I would say. Horror that's like trying to be different. <laughs> And trying to have like hidden meanings and have like, oh, this is what I'm trying to say. I find that doesn't work for me as well as I like camp horror. I like, you know, Grady Hendrix, like ridiculous, campy or aesthetic, spooky, witchy vibe horror. They're the two options that I think I prefer for horror. So I just don't think this is my kind of thing. You know, it's the kind of horror that's being clever. And I just don't know if I'm the target audience for that. So anyways, final book, Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson. I've decided this is gonna be five stars. I believe it, believe it, uh, it's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be five stars. Um, I am gonna take a break from reading for a little bit. In about four or five hours, I have got some reading sprints with my patrons, so I will start reading this then. And listen, I've just read some reviews, people talking about how heartwarming this is, found family. I'm excited, I believe, in my soul, this is gonna be five stars. And then my last question to you, I thought we'd do a fun one. If you could recommend one of your favorite books to one, or we can do more, of your characters, what would you recommend them? Oh my God. That's the worst question anyone's asked me. They're all, they're all miserable, so they should have something that they look forward to, like, um, I don't know, probably like, uh, Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just say um, for the zombie book Sloan, she could read something like fun about going to prom, Morning Goose Throwback, which is coming out this April 11th, I think it is. It's really good. I think you'd love it. It's like a, it's a, it's a teenage girl goes back in time to help her mother win Homecoming Queen. But it's like real. It's like very 90s, very 90s in the 90s. It's very funny, very, very. Oh my Vibrant, god! Right, it's hysterical. Oh. Yeah, and then <laughs> that sounds um, so good. <laughs> trying to think what else. Kara Thomas. Any of these gloomy, gloomy protagonists could totally dig into a Kara Thomas book. She also has a book coming out, Out of the Ashes, an adult novel about a girl that goes back to her hometown and to find out what happened to her parents and her sister who all burned alive in a fire. Whoa! Very uplifting. <laughs> 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 You're like, here, have more gloom. There you go. <laughs> I probably, I actually probably wouldn't recommend them any of the books that I recommended to you. Wow, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, well, I'm a reader, and so I, when I'm looking for, like, recommendations, there's, like, a, there are certain things that I'm looking for. Like, I'm looking for is, is, and there's no wrong way to read and review books. No, I just want to say yeah. that to any, any other YouTuber <laughs> that's watching. I'm not criticizing you. <laughs> I'm just favoring Meg. No. <laughs> uh, you know, like, I, what I noticed, and this is why I subscribed, it wasn't just because you like the project. I'm like, that's cool. I really, really like that she does. But it's, um, you look at the book, it's like, okay, here's what the book's trying to accomplish. Did it accomplish that? And then that's a separate thing of, did I like what it accomplished? I think these are two distinct things. And I think not, like, I think it's important to weigh mm. the experience and the expectation against what the book is doing. I mean, you you can still rate it however you want. You can rate it based on how it made you feel. Usually everyone does and they should. Yeah. But it's just, it's a really well-rounded recommendation. And I think that's why you have such a reach. And that's why people respond so positively because they're like, okay, she didn't like it, but she's telling me why I would. Mm. That's, that's a talent. I think that's a talent. Oh. Did you ever read like Roger Ebert's review? He's He was kind of like, he used to always have to defend, like why would you give this really ridiculous movie two thumbs up and you gave like, I don't know, Citizen Kane two thumbs up. Like how can you compare those two things? And it's like, well, you don't. It's no. two different kinds of thumbs up. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize I, I don't necessarily consciously do that, but I guess it's just like common sense because you've got to meet the book where it is and like go from there, you know? Like, but not everyone it's... wants. I mean, you don't have to. Not everyone has. Like, oh. It's a personal thing. I don't know. Still, but... <laughs> it's good. It's oh. good. I, I mean, that's why I watch. I'm like, okay, what am I going to read now? <laughs> what did Meg tell me I should read? Like, I've got Babel on my list. Oh. It's Babel, ba right? I don't know. <laughs> everyone, I say one and then everyone tells me it's the other one. And then, so now I just say both when I okay. talk about it because I don't know. I think, <laughs> I think uh, I get confused. Wait, Babel. So British people say Babel, um, uh, Americans say Babel. Yeah, that's what it is. So I'm Canadian, so I can say either. And you I'm can say either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Guys, I have great news. <laughs> I 
am loving this. I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm so happy. So in this, we are following our protagonist who had this kind of best friend when she was younger. A series of events meant that her friend has gone on to kind of this rich, <laughs> posh, expensive life. And she's kind of been stuck at home, working at a supermarket, feeling very dead end. And her friend asks her to come take care of her friend's husband's children who are now coming to live with them. And the only catch is they spontaneously combust. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I think you need to know going into this. And I am just loving it. It simultaneously is funny, has like this kind of dark humor to it. There's the way that this is written is so interesting because there's times where it kind of like, I don't want to say blurs reality, but like some of our characters just think in a way, in a, in a kind of thought pattern that you're like, okay. <laughs> We've now at the point I'm at, I'm halfway through. We have met the children and our protagonist, what is our, her name? Lillian, um, is taking care of them. And just like, it's just a story about kids who have been through trauma and like trying to help them and trying to heal them when no one up till now has wanted to. And it's just beautiful. And I can already tell I'm gonna love it. I just think it's written, like it's so, it's funny. It's heartwarming, yet it's like got a serious element to it. I just, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I couldn't stop reading it last night. You know, I think the way that our characters sometimes think is really interesting. I love a book that kind of like, I don't know how to describe it, where just characters think and act in a way that you wouldn't necessarily expect them to, but it makes for such an interesting book. And I just, oh, I'm just loving it. <laughs> and you just get the sense that like, relationships are gonna grow over the course of this book and you just want everyone to be okay. It's really short, but I'm just having like, I'm having the best time reading it. I'm having the best time reading it. And you've got like good antagonists, like their dad, we don't really like him. I get the sense we don't really like him. They're kind of like hiding her and the kids away in this like guest house down at the end of the garden. And just, I don't know, the commentary on like wealth and image and appearance is very interesting as well. So listen, I'm feeling good. <laughs> I'm feeling really good about this one. Just gotta try and have a PMA. The folks are PMA. Positive mental attitude. Get fucked. I think the kids spontaneously combusting when they feel anxious is such an interesting, I don't know, visible metaphor for like what can be going on inside kids and them not being able to uh, articulate when they're younger and are going through stuff. So listen, I'm just loving it. I'm gonna go ahead and finish it. It's feeling like a five star. I feel like we're finally gonna get a five star. <laughs> This is why I love doing a video like this because I would have never probably read this otherwise. Like I'd never heard of it. If Courtney hadn't put it on my on my radar, I probably never would have read it. So I'm loving it. I'm loving it. So I just finished Nothing to See Here. Five stars. We got a five star! Hey. <laughs> Success! I'm giving it five stars. I am so happy. <laughs> so happy. I loved this book. Oh my god, I cannot wait to read more from this author. If I'm honest, I wasn't expecting this to be the one I gave five stars, but I just loved it. I can't get over what a like a heartwarming book this is about what it means to be a family and being loved and being recognized and being listened to for the first time in your life and like what that means to a child. I don't know, it, just, it was so gorgeous. And I really loved our main perspective, our kind of narrative voice, Lillian. I thought she was just so interesting, right? There was just little elements to all of these characters, but particularly Lillian and Madison, even though we didn't see Madison a ton really, towards the latter parts of the book. There's just something so interesting about their characters and just little elements of them that really makes the book come alive. It's a difficult book to pitch because it's funny in elements, it's heartwarming, but it's like really a story of like child neglect and like, there's also these characters in this book that you kind of hate. I don't know. But I just loved the experience of reading it. I absolutely did. I am so thankful to Courtney for making me read this book because I don't think I would have ever read it otherwise. And it's a book that I feel like I can recommend to a lot of people. Certain books I love and read, and I'm like, okay, that was just something <laughs> I loved. <laughs> like, I don't feel like it's widely recommendable, but this is something I could see like my mom or like 
Tom's mom or like so many people in my life reading. I feel like it's really accessible to a lot of people. I loved the writing. I get, I think, was this the book that Courtney said? There's something about the way he uses words that is really interesting in this. I feel like it was, and I, if it was, I agree. <laughs> if it wasn't, I do think that about this book. Just the way that all of the language was, was structured and the sentence was structured, I just found it very interesting. Also, I thought in my last check and I mentioned how I was raising my station 11 rating to a four from a 3.5. I just couldn't stop thinking about it, right? And I think I felt like some glass hotel. I think I initially gave it not a low rating, but a lower rating than what I ended up giving it. Cause I just can't stop thinking about it. There's something about her books that I just can't stop thinking about. They kind of get in my head and rattle around in there. And so I've been thinking about this and what it did and what it was saying a lot. So I decided to give it a four. So we had at the end a 3.5 that I still did enjoy, a four and a five. I felt like we really good success rate. So I hope you guys enjoyed this vlog. It was so much fun having one of my favorite authors pick what I read. I just wanna say a massive thank you again to Courtney for participating in this video and doing it with me, doing an interview with me. Um, it was so much fun. And I had so much fun reading these books, books that apart from Station Eleven, I don't think I ever read these. Sorry, Freddie's upset. Freddie, it's okay. They're doing, around Tom's, they're doing work in the garden. So he's shut in here with me and he's not happy about it. Anyways, I will go. <laughs> but I'll say thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, oh, also don't forget to check out the giveaway down below. It's for copies, signed copies of I'm the Girl and Sadie. So if you're interested in that, which I don't know why you wouldn't be, <laughs> go check out. There's a Google form for you guys to fill in down below. Go check that out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you very soon in another one. Bye.